Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our tandem webinar. Uh, my name is Geertra Lano. I'm uh, the regional specialist working on migrant integration in the IOM office in Brussels, and I will be moderating uh, today's webinar. Uh, we're going to look at empowering youth as agents of integration and social cohesion, and more specifically, we will look at different type of mentorship schemes for students with a migrant or refugee background that have been initiated in the Tandem project, but also in other programs uh, elsewhere in the world. So we're going to discover some of the good practices, uh, not only in Europe, but even looking at Canada and Lebanon. So before we do I would just a short introduction about the Tandem project under which we are organizing today's webinar. So I will uh, share the presentation, just a moment. Good. Colleagues, can you confirm that you can see the presentation, please? Yes, I see colleagues can see. <laughs> Excellent. So let me go ahead with introducing the Tandem project. So Tandem is an EU funded project that looks at empowering um, migrant youth in Southern Europe. Yeah, sorry, just a moment. <laughs> Good, can you see the next slide? I'm trying to actually move the presentation. Sorry, the, the technology is not working with us today. Sorry, I will have to start again. I hope it is loading now. Good. So Tandem, as I said, is an EU-funded project that is looking at empowering migrant youth in Southern Europe. And basically, we are looking particularly at universities or higher education institutions because this is an environment where we feel that young people can actively contribute to social inclusion and cohesion. So the Tandem project is funded by the European Union AMIF, Asylum Migration and Integration Fund. It has a two years duration. It's implemented by IOM with two partners, the European University Association and CORACE. And we are looking at six countries, Croatia, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Malta, and Spain. And in total, there are 11 universities involved. Now, why are we focusing particularly on universities? Could I ask other colleagues to kindly mute your microphone? Thank you. Thanks a lot. So why universities? Well, we believe that education is a key for inclusion and we believe that young students can really be actively engaged in fostering diversity, fostering intercultural awareness and universities are the places where dialogue, intercultural dialogue, interreligious understanding can really take place. Now, in tandem, we have four specific project components. The first one is a regional campaign on social media that is contributing to changing the narrative and demystifying some of the stereotypes. 
pipe subration. We are implementing a component that relates to mentorship in universities. Colleagues, can you kindly mute your microphones? Thank you. Uh, this is actually going to be the topic of today's webinar. How such mentors are established and practice. Thirdly, we are also working on interreligious dialogue, so encouraging interfaith dialogue, interfaith understanding. Um, and then lastly, we also conducted a cross-country regional study on what are exactly the access-related needs and barriers for migrants and refugees in higher education and how can we promote more inclusive higher education. Now, we had a series of webinars before where we looked exactly into access to higher education. We looked at interreligious dialogue. We looked at changing the narrative, demystifying some stereotypes. Today, we're going to focus exclusively on the mentorship and how we can engage youth in universities, uh, particularly to become mentors of other students with a migratory or refugee background. Now, if you would like more information on the Tandem project, you can contact the Tandem team in our office in Rome, or of course, you can also have a look at the Tandem website, uh, which you can see here. So with that, I think we have introduced um, the Tandem project uh, for you. Um, and I'm happy to say that we have a program of and speak from different parts of the world like to share with you their experience on how they have established a student mentorship scheme in university or higher education institution. Now, I open the microphones. If you have any question, any comment, you would like to ask something to one of our speakers, uh, please. Please use the chat to ask uh, all your questions. So, as you might know, uh, Tandem Project uh, established uh, a student mentorship scheme um, in Italy and in Spain, but actually was inspired to do so by another program that is run in Canada. Um, in Canada Canada, the World University of Canada, or in short, WUSC, actually has a long-running and um, very strong students' refugee program. And it's that program that inspired us under Tandem to do some work. So we're very pleased to have with us today uh, Michelle Manx. Michelle Manx is actually Senior Manager Durable Solutions at WUSC, and she will tell us a bit more about the Canada Student Refugee Program and how that works. Michelle, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Can we also right. see your video? Great. Right. I just figured I would say hello quickly before I start sharing my presentation so you know which face <laughs> belongs to the voice Very on the other good. side. All right. So um, Very good. good morning for me. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for including us uh, in this webinar. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Yes. And hopefully it will work. I see the presentation is loading. Yes. Looks good so far, Michelle. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so it's interesting to hear that the that that our student refugee program was the inspiration for uh, the Tangent Project because um, student engagement in um, supporting the integration and access to education for refugee and displaced students actually started in the 1920s in Europe. Um, and so WUSC was inspired by European students um, who were taking action for um, uh, their peers who had been displaced by the First World War and then subsequently the Second World War to allow them to continue to, 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 to stay in school um, and continue their studies um, while they were displaced. And so that initiative um, uh, 
across the Atlantic in the 1940s, and we had our first student group at the University of Toronto early in the 1940s, and um, began sponsoring uh, refugee students to come to Canada um, as part of that initiative uh, at that time. Um, so our program is a relocation program um, because we don't get as many people coming to our borders um, as some of the European countries and other places. We participate in relocation and resettlement of students in order to expand the number of educational opportunities um, that are available to refugee students. And so we operate under Canada's private sponsorship of refugees program, which is a, a unique immigration program that allows um, organizations to sponsor refugees to come to Canada. Um, and last year, we celebrated our 40th anniversary of working under that infrastructure. And prior to that, students would come to Canada on student visas and other immigration channels. Um, so our program uh, is now called the Student Refugee Program, or the SRP for short, and we sponsor about 140 refugees to come to Canada every year um, from several different countries around the world to access post-secondary education and then to be supported by Canadian and international students who are on Canadian campuses for uh, the duration of their studies uh, at Canadian institutions. So we have campus groups at uh, over 94, almost 100 campuses right now, which makes up almost all of our university campuses across the country and a growing number of polytech college uh, technical vocational training institutions. And collectively, that makes up about a thousand student volunteers every year who are directly engaged in supporting the integration and access to education for refugee students. What else, the other thing that makes our program unique is that it's funded uh, in part by students uh, and the other piece is funded by post-secondary institutions, so almost matched by the post-secondary institutions. And students raise about $6 million in support of refugee education every year. So I know that's different than many European contexts because um, tuition is more expensive in Canada than it is elsewhere. Um, so that's where the funds go towards is paying tuition and living costs uh, for the students. And I'll talk more about how that happens uh, in a subsequent slide. So just to give you a sense of how it all comes together, WUSC identifies students who are in need of resettlement and a durable solution overseas um, and prepares them for academic um, integration in Canada before they come to Canada. And with our agreement with the Government of Canada, we're able to bring those students to specific communities where there are Canadian campuses across the country uh, so that they can pursue their studies. So we coordinate both the immigration piece and the um, academic matching of students to institutions at which they are admissible. And then the student groups in Canada are the ones that provide all of the support uh, to students once they arrive, from the time they arrive at the airport um, to the time they graduate. So currently we recruit students from six different countries of asylum, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Uganda, uh, the camps in Kenya, the camps in Tanzania, and Malawi. And the idea behind that is that um, we work in especially protracted um, situations or very large um, forced displacement crises um, to alleviate some of the pressures on uh, the first countries of asylum, um, and where there are not other durable solutions for refugees um, to access opportunities in their countries of asylum. We limit our program to those countries um, because our program is quite uh, labor intensive and resource intensive prior to a student's departure, and we're not able to spread ourselves uh, more broadly at this time. So the role of campus groups, what we call WUSC local committees, um, is to raise awareness on their campus to destigmatize forced migration and to counter uh, xenophobic sentiments and to create welcoming communities for refugees, as well as to support them socially um, and to support their academic integration. And our campus groups are made up mostly of students, but they're supported by university staff, and or faculty and a number of different offices on university campuses 
um, that can be leveraged to, to better support the integration of refugee students. Um, so different kinds of support that students provide are um, not only financial resources to students, uh, but also financial management and financial literacy skills. So um, because refugees, when they come to Canada, they're new to the country, they have to open up bank accounts, they have to, um, in some cases, access student loans beyond their first year, they need to access bursaries and scholarships to support their education beyond the first year, and they also mm -hmm. connect students to employment services um, on campus or in the community. Um, as you all know, it can be very difficult to obtain a job in a country um, that you are new to. And so um, this model helps to provide that first uh, employment experience that then allows students to get future employment opportunities. Um, our student groups also support the admissions process of students to the universities. Um, and then they help students connect to the different academic services on campuses that they might need or not be aware of otherwise, like extra computer training skills or, um, you know, academic referencing skills. Um, and then they, of course, help them connect to um, social networks in the community. So I briefly spoke about our funding model at the beginning. Um, I'll just uh, skim over it uh, in the interest of time, but our program is funded in combination uh, by financial contributions or in-kind contributions by the schools. So many schools will waive the tuition fee um, or residence fee, uh, meal hall or cafeteria expenses. Um, and the other piece largely comes from a student what we call a student levy, which is like a student tax that students pay voluntarily um, that ranges between 25 cents Canadian to about $20 Canadian um, per year. And all of those funds get collected by students and um, amalgamated to support the living expenses of the refugee students once they arrive. Um, what's nice about that model for us is that once a levy is in place, it is there pretty much indefinitely. So it ensures that there's sustainable funding on an ongoing basis. Um, and then in addition to the levies, uh, campus groups will also do fundraising, but really we rely the most on the commitments from the schools and the student levies. And so it's a holistic approach to funding um, a student refugee program and everyone on campus is involved um, and contributes in some way. So um, I just wanted to share uh, some photos of some of our campus groups and the types of activities that they do. Um, so uh, because students are in Canada on their own with their, their families, they rely largely on the student groups and their families um, for social support. Um, and uh, the, the families of our student volunteers and often end up being the families, uh, the adopted families of the refugee students who come to Canada. Um, so you can see some of um, these photos that there's a student sharing Christmas with um, volunteers and we teach them about um, Canadian culture. So we'll do Canadian cultural orientation. The photo on the right is um, pumpkin carving um, at Halloween this past year. The other thing they do, as I mentioned, is they raise awareness about refugee issues. So they will um, go into classrooms, they'll hold um, events on campus in the hallways, they'll do quiz nights, um, a, a variety of different ways to engage their campus communities um, to help destigmatize. And often the refugee students will be involved um, in those activities themselves. And the objective is to change the narrative. Um, like I said, so um, we have growing xenophobia in Canada, um, as with much of the world. Um, and so our aim is to share the positive stories of immigration and, ref and refugee contributions uh, to try and counter some of those things. So in addition to holding activities on campus, we our campus groups try to also engage the media on these issues to tell the positive stories. Um, to share the message 
out a little bit more broadly than just the campus community. So they'll often do activities within their communities as well off campus. Um, and these are just some examples. And then, um, as I mentioned, um, campus groups will do fundraising. Often the fundraising activities for us are um, more of a public engagement awareness raising activity um, than they are a revenue generating um, activity, even though it generates some revenues to a small extent, um, but really what it helps do is um, engage more people uh, on the issues. Um, so some of these photos are examples of when we do our referendum campaign to to add that student levy or the student tax that I was mentioning before. Um, and we often use the message of, you know, for the price of this cup of coffee, you could help a refugee continue their education um, or for the price of for the for the change that you find in your sofa, you could help a refugee continue their education. Um, and so student groups get quite creative about how they um, pass this tax on campus. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is um, the, the collaboration with other offices on campus. So because Canadian schools welcome many international students every year, we have many services already existing on campus to support um, international student integration. So we try and leverage those offices and services to support students. We also have strong uh, mental health centers. We have um, diversity and inclusion centers. So really the role of our student groups is to connect refugee students or displaced students with those offices rather than taking on all of the tasks themselves. Um, and we have close collaboration with the admissions offices and registrar to help students um, be able to access um, opportunities. So um, that is a really, crucial component to our program because many refugee students will have fled without their documents or with incomplete documentation and it takes flexibility on the part of university registrars and admissions offices um, in order for students to be able to access um, education. Um, yeah and I think I mentioned the other things maybe the 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 benefits of the program, I think, we often think about the benefits of these types of initiatives um, as benefiting the, benef the beneficiaries, the, the student refugees, but I think it's important not to underestimate the positive impact that it has on host community students and opening their minds, engaging them on um, global issues, um, developing their cross-cultural understanding and skills, it uh, enriches classrooms as it adds diversity in classrooms um, and it increases awareness amongst youth in the community about forced migration more broadly. Um, so we, when we did an impact study on our program, we found that, um, um, that not only Canadian students benefited, but their networks as well. Um, so students reported that their friends, family, classmates, co-workers all also deepen their understanding of forced migration issues um, aunts uncles grandmas grandpas um, learned because of um, the volunteers experience and engagement on the program um, we also learned that 74 percent of students or student volunteers remain engaged in global issues and that forced migration issues impact the way that they vote in the future so the idea is that if you can engage young people in the beginning, uh, or, or if you engage people when um, they're university students, they carry that knowledge and experience with them into workplaces as they graduate and into their communities um, after graduation. And then of course the program has an impact on refugee students. So what we found is that nine out of 10 students that have come to Canada through our program, it's actually 94%. So 94% of students graduate with a, with a degree um, and as was mentioned at the beginning, we feel that education is an important way uh, to support uh, integration, self-reliance, um, agency. Um, three out of four of the students surveyed were employed in their field, and a higher percentage were employed um, more broadly in Canada. Um, and many people become, in our case, 
Canadian citizenship. So eight out of 10 students become Canadian citizens after they graduate um, and are eligible to apply. So in the interest of time, um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, our role as an organization is to coordinate everything and to do the monitoring and evaluation and provide training to the campus groups. And I'll be happy to answer more questions at the end after um, the other presenters have shared uh, about their programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. That was uh, very interesting and very inspiring indeed. It's uh, good to hear that you were inspired by your European student that now we here in Europe are inspired again by you. So like this, we keep on uh, learning from uh, each other. Um, now I was particularly impressed to see also, you know, how, how um, the students in Canada are also engaged in, in the fundraising as such and, and the amounts, you know, of funds that were raised to, to support refugee education. That's, that's impressive. And as you rightly said, that it's not just about the fundraising as such, but that it is part, let's say, of a bigger awareness raising, you know, to, to share also the positive, to, to change um, the narrative and the impact that that has on the, the community and not just, you know, the refugee students. So really beautiful. Thanks a lot, Michelle. And uh, I invite all colleagues who would have any questions uh, for Michelle about the Canadian um, program to, you know, raise them in the chat. So with this, I think we can move on to another part of the world which is Lebanon, and because in Lebanon there's a very interesting program called uh, Rescue, which is about refugee education support in the MENA countries. And here we will have uh, two speakers from Lebanon who will explain a bit more how they went about, you know, establishing basically uh, support uh, units or counseling uh, models for refugee students. So we will start with uh, Nisrin Musaileb. And uh, Nisrin is currently working as an officer at a refugee student orientation support unit, in short, RSOS, at the uh, University, the Lebanese University in Lebanon. Nisrin, I can already see you. Can we also hear you? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I hear you well. Would you like to share your presentation? Yes, of course. So uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, webinar. It's an honor. And uh, I'll share with you my presentation. Uh, just a second. Can you see it? Yes, I see okay. rescue, so I that must start. be right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Please, please so go ahead. In, yes, so in my presentation, I will introduce the Lebanese University and also talk about the services offered at the RSS unit and uh, their impact on students and the academic community in general. I cannot move the slide. And I had the same problem earlier on, Nasrin. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay. Ah, here so, it is, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we can see fun. your slides. Okay. I'm beginning. Yes, now it's working, I guess. Yeah, so uh, the Lebanese University is the largest university in Lebanon. It has around 80,000 students, out of which 1,700 uh, 1, uh, students are Syrian refugees. It has uh, 16 faculties all, 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 all around Lebanon. We have faculties in the north, in the south, in the Bekaa, where most of the refugees are concentrated. Uh, I'll try to show you a small video uh, to explain the context in which the RSS unit was born in Lebanon and the synergies between the RSS unit and the Lebanese University. So, uh, just a second.
Yes, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm to, not sure uh, the video would work because the connection from Lebanon doesn't seem to be very good. Okay, no worries. So I'll just uh, continue. And just let me. Maybe if you could over. share the link to the video. Yes, I, I could share it in the, no the chat room and then you can. In the chat, please. Up. Thank yes, you. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And then you could look it up. So I'll just stick to the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so this is where we work. Okay, this is our basically our team. We're uh, four officers are working at the RSS unit, and uh, this is our uh, monitoring visit. Uh, monitoring visit that we uh, had in April, I guess, if I remember well. Mm -hmm. um, in order to integrate the refugees in the the RSS unit was created to integrate the refugees in the academic community. The goal of the unit was to build the capacity of the students to improve their academic life and help them with the challenges they face in the process. In order to create a strong and functional unit, we attended several seminars and study visits in Turkey, Rome, Barcelona, and uh, most recently Berlin, to hone our skills, but also to to deliver quality services for refugees. Uh, on the national level, we explored opportunities uh, with UNHCR for English courses and DAFI scholarships as well. Uh, once the staff was ready and the location of the office were set and fully operational, we made a dissemination campaign to promote the services of our unit. We sent emails to all of the Syrian students at the Lebanese University to invite them to join the unit and benefit from its services. Also, we gave students brochures in all the campuses so they could see the, the, the officers, the services that we have. So uh, we offer academic orientation, administrative guidance, scholarship guidance, language courses, and we also offer professional development. Uh, the unit offers academic orientations for students who are not sure about the options that they have at the Lebanese University. Usually you have two types of students coming at the RSS unit. We have those who work and those who don't work. Uh, so for those who work, the primary concern is to find a balance between their academic and professional lives. They often ask us about majors that don't require entrance exams or majors that are not strict with attendance. And our role at the unit is to explain the entrance requirements of each faculty and major to suit the needs of those students so they could have this balance in their lives. As for students who don't work and uh, who are confused about which major to choose, our role is to help them match their skills and ambition with the right major. Uh, now for the administrative guidance, uh, as you know, our campuses is, uh, are very huge and uh, students are not sure on where to start or how to manage their application. They don't know where to submit their documents, whom to contact, or what are the papers needed. And uh, our role at, at this unit is to provide necessary guidance and save the students from all the bureaucratic hurdles that could uh, stand in their education, stand the way of their education. Also, in the, in the administrative support, many students ask us about uh, how to get the accreditation for their degrees. So we explain to them which documents are needed and from where to get them to, so they could ensure that all their documentation is done properly. Uh, now the third offer, the, uh, the third uh, service that we offer is language courses. Um, as most of you already know, language is a huge barrier for senior students wherever they go. Like even if they go to an Arabic speaking country such as Lebanon, the problem is still there. Why? Because most of the education done in Lebanon is either in English or in French. And uh, the refugees lack, lack the necessary fluency to attend the courses at the university in those languages. So they struggle to keep up with their peers and they struggle with their grades as well. 
And uh, in order to mitigate this language barrier, we set up intensive English courses for all the students enrolled at the university so they could be more confident in the classroom. Uh, here, like when we finished the course uh, at the Lebanese University, the students requested certificates, official certificates at the end of the course. So now we are preparing them and uh, hopefully the president of the university will sign them soon and will distribute them to everyone who attended. Uh, the professional development was uh, part of the services delivered by the RSS unit. Uh, many teachers held work workshops to help the students with CV writing and uh, they explained to students how to write motivation letters. Uh, the students really appreciated this part because it helped them understand the job hunting process better and uh, helped them also uh, understand the job market better. Uh, yes, so in general, students were interested in this unit. They were constantly emailing or calling the RSS unit to inquire about the services provided or to set appointments. Uh, I think the RSS unit was a success since it was inclusive. It included students from all the campuses, all majors to benefit from its services without any kind of discrimination. Uh, the goal of the unit was to support refugees in accessing the Lebanese educational system, but it also made the students feel welcomed, and I think that this is really important because when students feel welcomed, they integrate better. And uh, with the academic guidance, students learn to set goals and achieve them. With the administrative guidance, students were freed from all the bureaucratic hurdles and were able to focus on education. And with language support, students became more confident and were able to participate in the classroom and voice their opinion. So it's fair to say that the RSS unit was a key element to ensure successful integration of refugees, since it built the capacity of students and that helped them feel welcomed and integrated. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much. I think very once refugee students feel welcome, they integrate better and they can focus on their education. I think that's very true and it's very here how helping to create this uh, welcoming um, environment. Uh, now we have another speaker from Lebanon, uh, Marie-Christine. And Marie-Christine Ujam actually is a PhD student who's working at an international help desk of uh, the International Affairs Office of the Holy Spirit University of Kazlik. And uh, she will also explain uh, the model that they're using, the counseling center model, which is actually also uh, under the, the same rescue project. So, Marie-Christine, I can see you. Can we also hear you? I can see you. Uh, can you confirm that you can hear me, please? Yes, Marie-Christine, we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Allow me first to thank you all uh, on behalf of the Holy Spirit University of Catholic for inviting me to this interesting webinar. And I want to thank all the attendees for listening to me. And now I will try to share my presentation with you. So okay. Can you see you can it? can click on the share screen. Okay. One second, please. So I shared my screen. Okay. Is it working? Uh, not yet. Okay. So. Okay. If you click on the share screen. Mm -hmm. I think now it's working. So. I see it's loading. Okay. okay. Refugee education support in MENA countries. That must be right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you all please confirm that you can see the presentation? Yeah, we can see it well. Okay, so I will start. Uh, my contribution today uh, to this webinar will be about the counseling center model. Uh, best practices from Lebanon. So firstly, I will talk briefly about the UZEC RSOS unit. Secondly, I will talk briefly also about the rescue highlights. 
Then I will move to the UCC model and practices to finally talk about the integration and the social cohesion as USEC core values. So let me start first by giving you some background information about the USEC RSOS unit. The USEC RSOS unit services are delivered by two subunits. The first subunit is the USEC International Help Desk, and the second subunit is the USEC Counseling Center, UCC. So the USEC International Help Desk aims at guiding students according to their needs. Migrants, as well as international students, may need a specific support, like for instance, orientation, guidance among the USEC units and campus facilities, international advising, scholarships abroad, opportunities offered by NGOs or international organizations, etc. Whereas the USEC Counseling Center uh, delivers counseling services, either individual or group counseling, crisis intervention and orientation, confidential short-term counseling, groups and workshops, and psychoeducational programs, awareness raising and prevention. As you, as you are aware of uh, the Refugees Education Support in MENA Countries Now Rescue Project, which is co-founded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union, USEC, as a partner uh, of Rescue, hosted actually a social and psychological training and life skills training and also a training on conflict management and mediation. USEC also staff, me and my colleagues actually, participated in various study visits, trainings and workshops about migration, student mobility programs, services for refugees, psychological support for students and counseling services. We also met with key stakeholders in the field of vulnerable student assistance, so such as UNHCR, Estali Center, and Caritas. And uh, actually, during the rescue trainings in Italy, uh, we had the chance to, to meet and interact with IOM Project Tandem Student Committees. This fruitful collaboration between UNIMED Rescue and IOM Project Tandem, which aimed at fostering intercultural understanding and an inclusive university environment, identified synergies between Tandem peer-to-peer -peer support for refugees, foreign students, and universities, and the mission and objectives of our RSOS unit. In the scope of this webinar, I will uh, specifically focus now on the USEC Counseling Center model and practices. So, indeed, as uh, we are all aware, creating a safe haven that provides a listening ear and counsel to every student at USEC who seeks advice and guidance is at the core mission of the UCC. So, our UCC provides the following services to all USEC students, without exception, crisis intervention and orientation, confidential short-term counseling, groups and workshops, and psychoeducational programs. Um, I want here to shed the light on the fact that counseling can help students understand and manage many issues pertaining, for instance, to stress, eating disorders, sleep disorders, depression and anxiety, addiction, relational and emotional problems, behavioral disorders, feeling of loneliness, communication problems, conflicts with parents and peers, and also difficulties uh, re related to self-esteem and assertiveness, for instance, and even suicide thoughts. And here I want to shed the, the light on the importance of these services because we are talking here about a context of migration. So students uh, may need this. And we are here, of course, to help them. Now I would like to expand uh, on uh, the point uh, about the UCC practices that are actually split into two categories. The first one is the prevention and awareness raising programs, and the second one is the interactive trainings and workshops. So for the first part, uh, you want to mention that UCC develops, implements, animates, or evaluates programs whose objectives include prevention of violence and bullying, conflict resol resolution, uh, promoting practices also that encourage social inclusion and the sense of belonging. And here I want to mention that this is mainly uh, uh, related to, to this webinar, actually, uh, the development of healthy lifestyle habits, the prevention of addictions, as I've already said, and uh, the intervention or the postvention following a critical event. Now for the second part, for the interactive trainings and workshops, uh, UCC at USEC organizes group meetings for students as well as for university staff. 
so actually it facilitates trainings and information activities on uh, various themes or activities to foster the development of new skills. Topics can be, of course, uh, very diverse, uh, like, for example, the sexual uh, orientation, the violence in the, uh, in the relationships, uh, suicide, bereavement, emotional loss, mental health in general, of course. I want to mention here an example of a workshop on inclusion that was uh, done in collaboration with the USEC Department of Psychology and the Learning and Teaching Excellence Center, LTEC, here at USEC. And um, I want to mention also uh, a seminar uh, in the scope of the rescue project that was done on uh, interculturality and education to the staff at USEC that um, deals with the students in particular. Okay. Uh, okay. Ask so all the colleagues office? to mute their microphones because we're hearing somebody talking in the background. Please mute your microphone so we can uh, hear Marie Christine. <laughs> Mary Christine, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to mention here also in addition that the RSOS unit at USEC is preparing more courses that aims at providing students soft skills, language proficiencies, and more workshops also that will be available and promoted online. These courses are part uh, actually of the general education courses and open to all USEC students. Uh, their expected learning outcomes include supporting students in English or French languages, introducing the concepts of citizenship, human rights, dialogue and ethics, philosophy and critical reasoning, respecting the differences of others, and raising awareness on cultural and religious diversity. Uh, I want to mention also here uh, an example of the civic and the citizenship education course. I will move on now. To the last slide. Here I want to shed light uh, on the integration and the social okay, cohesion as our university core value. Yeah. So outside the formality of courses, student life at USEC takes several shapes and offers occasions to develop new skills and knowledge. USEC organizes gatherings and events on campus for all international students without exception, as well as tours and visits to encourage them to mingle together and share new experiences. Now, because we are talking about a special context, uh, for sure, arriving in a new country and a new university in the context of migration can bring anxieties. So to help all students have a good start at ISEC, the International Affairs Office has introduced what we call the Be a Body program. So what's a Be a Body program? This program actually will allow students to share experiences learn about new cultures and improve their linguistic skills while making new friends. And here also I want to uh, share with you that the shadowing body will actually help the student avoid potential cultur cultural shock, help the student adapt to his new environment, introduce him to other Lebanese friends and other friends in general, help the student with the administrative steps, show the students around and familiarize them with the campus, had the student in, his, in the accommodation search, and finally accompany the student on sightseeing trips, as you can see in the photos on the slide. Now I will conclude with a quote by uh, Carmen Martinez. She said uh, that the more we increase the active participation and partnership with young people, the better we serve them. And the more comprehensively we work with them as service partners, the more we increase our public value to the entire community. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention, and I am happy to answer any question that you might have. And I will also um, write uh, for you uh, my contact information. As you can see here, there is the rescue refugees site. I will share with you my contact information and uh, the website of USEC, of our university. So please, please, so please, please feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you so much again for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie-Christine. And feel free to leave, you know, your, your contacts and addresses in, in the chat function. Um, it was really nice to hear that you actually interacted with a tandem student committee, and I see a lot of similarities between 
you know, the, the respective programs, particularly this uh, buddy program that you're running, which is indeed a very nice way to, to also, you know, help students to adapt to their new environment. And I particularly like the quote um, at the end uh, that you showed. So yes, let's try uh, to engage uh, more. Now, um, I, I invite all participants who would like to raise uh, a question to use uh, already also have um, the website of the rescue project, the website of USEC, and we also have here further information on the WUSC uh, program uh, that was earlier presented uh, with uh, a video in English and um, in French. So uh, I hope uh, you can all uh, explore a bit more after this webinar about the programs uh, in Canada and Lebanon. But now I think it's time for us to look a bit closer at what we are doing here in Europe under the Tandem project, because uh, one of the components of the Tandem project was precisely to set up also a student mentorship scheme um, in universities uh, in Italy and in Spain. So we have with us uh, Yasmin uh, Cinchini. And uh, Yasmin is um, a PhD student uh, in international uh, law at the University of Pisa. And Yasmin is actually uh, a member of the Tandem Student Committee in Pisa, and she will tell us a bit more about um, setting up uh, mentorship schemes in universities, the Tandem experience. So Yasmin, I can see you. Can, can we also hear you? you? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, me. We hear you very well. Okay, thank you for inviting me to join this webinar. And now I'm trying to share my screen. So, can you see? Can you see my presentation? It takes a bit of time, not yet. Yasmin, can you try again? Just click on the share screen button. Yes. I think it's loading now. Can you see it now? Ah, setting up mentorship schemes in university. This is the tandem experience. That looks good. Okay, so I can start with my presentation, which is about uh, the setting up of mentorship schemes in uh, university. And in particular, I will share with you my experience within the tandem committee of, of PISA. Um, so the leading idea of this project is that the educational community, and especially by stimulating the active involvement of European youth in integration strategies, can play a fundamental role in promoting the integration of their country students and at the same time challenging the misleading perception on migration and on multiculturalism. Um, the, the mentorship scheme relies on, on the active involvement of groups of students in building a more inclusive academic environment. And this happens by acting as mentors for students with a migratory background and by providing them with all the tools they need to become full members of the academic community and also of the civil society where they belong. Uh, this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, kind of support represents the added value of this youth-led scheme. And the, the, implement, the implementation of the project has also revealed that students are one of the most dynamic groups of the society, uh, since uh, they are able to, to drive inclusion from within. Um, as regards the setting up of this uh, mentorship scheme, 
we have created three, three student committees established in three different Italian universities, uh, which are the University of Pisa, which I represent, but also the University of Rome, La Sapienza, and the University of Naples. Uh, each committee is composed by five students and by one professor focal point. Um, and initial training, as well as other um, training sessions, throughout the year were delivered by IUM in Rome. And as a student committee, we organized um, a work plan, uh, one for each uh, university, in order to map the services and identify which were the main shortcomings that needed to be addressed in each context. We also identified different roles among the, the three groups, and we provided, in particular, uh, in particular, three types of support at social, administrative, and academic level. And more specifically, with, uh, we provided support as regard the, the translation of documents uh, into Italian, um, with the residence permit and, uh, and the related procedures. Um, and we also help students with uh, the opening of a bank account and with the acquisition of a tax code. And especially, we also help them to, to enroll um, uh, at the university and uh, to register to specific courses. Um, and in addition, we also organize some intercultural events, such as city tours, uh, intercultural dinners, uh, speaking days, uh, and, uh, and study groups. And as regards the sustainability uh, of the scheme, we invited other mentors to join uh, the committees during the year, and the training to the junior mentors were, were delivered by the senior mentors. Um, we have seen that uh, supporting access and, and staying and inclusion of uh, third country nationals and refugee students uh, in our universities contributes to empower them to play an active role in the student society in terms of capacity building, social inclusion, and ownership of, uh, of their own path. Um, we, we have supported more than 250 students uh, thanks to the involvement, the, the active engagement of more than 40 mentors in the three universities. And one of the most important aspects that I would like to underline is that some of the students that we have supported uh, became mentors themselves. Um, in conclusion, uh, we have observed that promoting inclusive higher education systems is uh, important to improve the access um, of uh, third country students to higher education. Um, that some of the adopt measures for foreign students may have the potential of becoming uh, permanent features of the respective educational systems. Um, as, we, as I said, uh, this peer-to-peer -peer, um, kind of support is empowering both for mentors and for mentees. And understanding different contexts uh, and consequently establishing di diverse pathways to meet mm, different needs is crucial to have an effective impact. This because we, we can use general guidelines, but strategies and methodologies necessarily have to be adapted to the different and specific um, context uh, of each university. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin. Very interesting to hear about the work of the tandem committee in Pisa. Now, you said uh, towards the end of your presentation that this peer-to-peer -peer approach is um, empowering for both uh, the mentors and the mentees. Now, you as a tandem student committee member or as a mentor, what is it that you take from this? Well, what is it perhaps that, that you know, you learned in this process? 
Yes, uh, as I said, it, it was one of the most interesting aspects of, uh, of this uh, mentorship experience to, to learn, um, of course, to learn about uh, different, um, about the um, uh, different culture, different, um, different stories, to share experience stories. I mean, uh, the, the most, um, the most interesting aspect is that this, um, this uh, process is from, from uh, local students to international students, but also from international students to local students. And it's, um, it's very important to share, not only to give support to these students, but also to share um, everything about uh, everyday life. And many of the, um, of the students that we supported became our, our friends. And this happened in Pisa as well as in Rome and in Naples. And it was, I think it was, uh, it has been the, the real added value of this uh, mentorship scheme. Okay, that's very, very good to hear. Now, I would imagine that setting up such a mentorship scheme is also not easy. Were there any challenges you faced while setting this up? Um, to set up the mentorship scheme. No, uh, yeah, it was, um, I mean, it was challenging at the beginning, uh, but um, we, in PISA, uh, we collaborated with the international offices of our universities, and so it was easier for us because we could meet uh, uh, international students from the beginning. We also had some refugee students, so we had the possibility to to help these students from from the beginning and to prepare a well organized work plan. And so uh, it was yes, it was easier for us, and we had no particular problems in doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Very good to hear about uh, your experience uh, under Tandem. And I suggest we hear now from another student, Ana Lucia Martin Peredes, who is actually a member of the Tandem Student uh, Committee in Madrid. Ana Lucia, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Ah, very good. I can see you. How are you? Very good. Right now, good. As, I will, as I will tell you, I'm not in Madrid. I'm in Germany studying ah, now. Very international. <laughs> yes. If I can just ask, mm -hmm. um, Yasmin, could you stop sharing your screen? And then um, Ana Lucia? Can you share yours? Yes. So you, mm. you're in Berlin. No, I'm in Regensburg. Oh. The small Very city nice. in Bavaria. <laughs> so, so I think you will tell us both about your experience uh, being a tandem committee member in Madrid, but, but also your experience as a student in another country, is that right? Exactly. So, do you see my, my yes. screen? Yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, I hope it will not take so long. <laughs> so, um, as it says in the presentation, I will, I will speak about multicultural education and the inclusion of the international students in my own experience. So at first I will speak about my role in the tandem group at the Complutense University, then about my double experience as a student in different countries, as I said, in Spain and in Germany, and some key elements that I saw in my experience and in the experience of others that can help in youth in creating inclusive academic societies. So, can you see me? 
Yes. Okay, so um, at first I got involved in the mentors program at the US at the Complutense, thanks to a friend that she wanted also to participate, and we started both um, in this uh, in the tandem uh, group like directly. Um, not only because we saw that uh, new students have needs, but because the international students they even have. Uh, more help to get adapt to the university and academic life. Because here in, in Madrid, we, we got uh, students from Venezuela, Ecuador, Morocco. Now we have a lot of Chinese students too, that some of them, because of the language, they have more difficulties. And of course, uh, we have refugees and, and students with social and personal difficulties at their home country. So if we want to add, uh, some change um, we have to start locally and that's why I know I cannot change the world and I know there that needs a lot of teamwork so that's why I started to to keep uh, with this project uh, in tandem and the group in uh, the tandem group in Madrid we are in like our first steps we are like working behind the scenes of what is going to be uh, helpful for new students. And I like this project because it's seen with a long-term point of view. <clears throat> and the first thing we are doing is looking for information that has to fulfill the needs of the students, as well as local and accessible activities. And here in this picture is part of our team and as uh, Jasmine told before, we have like also three kind of uh, groups. Is there is the social group, the cultural group, and the administrative and academic group. So in my uh, my task was uh, part of the administrative information group, and I was looking for like scholarships, ways to. Um, uh, be more accessible, this kind of information. And all, at the end, all together, we were collaborating with the welcome uh, group in the Complutense and also with um, other um, organizations, international organizations. <clears throat> um, and now, like my experience, I can see like both of the uh, of the size of the coin and my experience in Spain as a welcome student um, was the aim to protect and to promote the cultural diversity as I come from myself from a, a diversity family. Um, uh, I started, um, I wanted to uh, give the new students uh, to find uh, opportunities to create their own routine without the need to change their own identity uh, in, in order to, to, to adapt to the new country. That means like um, to be Chinese and maybe as the stereotypes say they are more shy or they don't express that much, but uh, to to be able to connect with Spanish people uh, in a way that doesn't uh, take from you that part, that part that makes you you, you know, like the cultural thing. And in in that in that time, I was also part of different uh, projects. Like uh, I was part of the Unity of Gender and Equality um, Association, like making. Uh, projects to to involve uh, uh, the university in equality. So, uh, for example, we could make a network um, between we, the tandem group, and this unity. Just uh, at least finding contacts, uh, you know. And um, I was also part, like uh, as uh, Jasmine said. Uh, of uh, building up the information to uh, help new students to find a home, 
to uh, have language exchanges where they could develop uh, better their language skills, to find scholarships and monetary help, and other student group of interest because um, there is also the need of make the personal um, uh, development and to keep the one self values um, in the new country where uh, one is going to live. And here in Germany, um, I'm finding, for example, uh, the first barrier is the language. I'm a very participative person in class, and here I cannot uh, really participate that much. I need more time to read, to write these days, and an extra help from friends and that are German speakers uh, or that have been here for a long time. Uh, uh, that means like I have a friend from Morocco that he has been living here for uh, five or more years and he can speak very fluently in German and he really helps me uh, in social time and in academic moments too. Uh, and also um, another barrier that I'm finding is just because of the I don't have that my that a very good German uh, level. I need um, an extra effort to find groups uh, that will fulfill my personal development and that aren't only uh, language exchanges. Um, another. Uh, like, it's not a problem, but it's just something that happens when two cultures uh, find each other, uh, even though we are like part from Europe, of course, uh, there is always something that um, it's semiotic, you know, this, um, and it's uh, the misunderstandings. But I really found uh, um, helping to have a open mind and to see it not personal, but to see it as a um, as a thing to communicate about and to be clear of what you understood and what uh, do you want it to or what do you want to mean and to explain and to take more time into explaining whatever you want to say, even though the language barrier there is always a way to communicate in in groups within groups. Um, what helped me the most was to to have a mentality of okay i'm going to be living here for at least two years and i want to build my own routine and my home i um, so that means that i'm looking for uh, stability in my day-to-day -day life and for example being active and told to talk to my neighbors in the residence where I live, that makes me the feeling of arriving to a home, not to a room. That means that uh, whenever we are in the kitchen, we are like a family, let's say. And to take, um, also to take oppor any opportunity with local activities to make friends, like uh, a normal day, like be in a cafeteria and talking to people, even though it might it must be weird at the first time. But if I stay in my comfort zone, it's not um, it's not going to help me to be um, you know like to feel at home. I don't know how to say. And also a very uh, big key for me was finding a job in a small cafe where I go like every day to work and to help to the family that is working and that has the coffee. And this means for me that um, it's more it's more close, like it's not a, a big company which has their workers and everybody is like a number. No, it's more like a person to person and they are very patient. They are also international because my boss is from England. And I think that also helps to, um, to know the difficulties of the language and, and to be caring 
you know, like to express um, the empathy. And of course, like um, we, I don't have to forget about uh, the support of the international office in, here in the university because it's very active. Anytime that we need something to, to be clear, we can contact them and immediately in the same day they can uh, offer us a solution or uh, an uh, answer. And also here uh, there is a big Erasmus community, so anytime that um, we want to, you know, have uh, more involvement in international activities, there is this big community here. And that also, um, I don't know, it, it makes you to embrace your own culture and to share it to other people too, because other people is also sharing it. And that's beautiful. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, what I learned in Spain was to was that it's really need to make more visible the offer of inclusive groups in all the faculties because there are sometimes that, for example, my faculty, the philology faculty, there you can see they're more inclusion. I don't know why, but the cafeteria is the place where you can meet anybody and all the groups are very open to um, be talkative and so on. But for example, in the faculty of law, the groups are more close. I don't know if why is that, but it's something that we we have to overcome in order in order to uh, make more um, uh, inclusive the offer in every faculty. We also uh, I have also have learned that uh, the more um, community groups and international groups we have, the more strengths and experiences we can share and the better offer we can give. Uh, and so there is also this strength point that is to know the needs of the students that come to the university, whatever they are language to feel lonely or mm, to not have enough money to make activities that require money. So that means that we have to look for uh, activities that are for everybody at uh, doesn't matter their income or their status. Um, also that because of the differences in cultures and also like in personalities, uh, parties, events aren't for everybody. That means that um, of course like we can make a party time to time but um, it's also very important to take in account the um, like how is uh, someone like does they like to uh, party? Are they more shy? Are they more? Uh, do they prefer to go to eat or to make dinner at home? Uh, there are different kinds of uh, people, and uh, most of the things that I saw is that. Party events are the key ones in other group, uh, in other community groups, and maybe that is not for everybody. Whatever is for, from the alcohol or the the um, the time, or they have to work. So it's important to find other kind of activities, and that's why I find it that sports and regular meetings with a schedule are. Um, uh, tend to uh, promote long-term uh, relationships um, because there is more time, there is more patience to get to know somebody. And uh, since it's regular, it's it makes the people also to um, um, have a routine and um, a normalization of their lives. Uh, as yeah. <laughs> And what I'm learning in Germany, I'm, I'm not so much time here, but what I've learned um, until now was to not stick with the Spanish group because sometimes we can stick together uh, a lot. So, and that means like um, to overcome the language barrier and just go and do it. Like, let's go and talk with, <laughs> 
with anybody that wants to be my friend, of course, and uh, to promote a health, healthy group with uh, with diff, uh, like different values and to different with different perspectives too, and to build like this a uh, family uh, in present and for the future. And also to get involved in local activities of my interest. Uh, like right now, I'm looking forward what to meet the Fridays for Future group here in Regensburg. And uh, of course, like it, sometimes it's difficult to ask for help. And I'm learning to ask for help anytime I need uh, to the student networks that I find here. And also, when the time comes, uh, to be part of them too. So, Ana Lucia, thank you very you much you. for sharing <laughs> your experience. It's very interesting to hear the both sides of the story. One, you as part of the Tandon Student Committee in Madrid, and the other the one you actually being, you know, an international student in another uh, country. Uh, I think, you know, the key elements that you mentioned will definitely help others, other students who are thinking of establishing or running a student mentorship scheme. I think these, these are very good tips. And I just remember at the start you said, I know I cannot change the world, but I'm sure that as part of the on the student committee, you changed the world for some students, uh, some refugees. So really, thank you very much um, for your commitment on that. I think with this, we can move on to our final speaker. And the final speaker is uh, actually um, a Syrian refugee, Rola Issa. Rola, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you Excellent. hear me? Yes, yeah, we hear okay. you well. <laughs> So Rola is actually um, enrolled in a master's degree at the University uh, La Sapienza in Rome, in Italy. And she was uh, initially supported by the Tandem Student Committee, but then uh, afterwards she actually joined the committee herself and was also trained to become um, a mentor. So uh, Rola, we are uh, very much interested to hear what was your experience, uh, both being a mentee and then afterwards, you know, what motivated you to become a mentor yourself? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, actually, I, w I want to say I don't have a slide to share, but I have my story. That's to share okay, with don't you. worry. <laughs> That's more important. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I uh, actually I will share my story with Tandem, which uh, which was last year when I uh, I arrived here to Rome. I get a problem to, to, with re uh, to renew my, uh, my permission. I was asking for everyone uh, for any help. So one of uh, my colleagues told, told me about Tandem. And I said, in the beginner year, I have a problem with my document. And they are a group of students, and they are in the university. What can do for me? But I will try. <laughs> so I, uh, I, went, I, I went there. I remember well, uh, very meeting with them. When uh, when I contact one of them, but they came in group to listen to my problem, to to see how can uh, they can help me. Uh, actually, yeah, they they were uh, very friendly and very available. Uh, they uh, they went with me to uh, to many places like uh, police office and uh, city hall and another yeah, other right. places. To, uh, to to resolve my problem. Uh, finally, after seven months, I resolve it, and I get a new permission, and everything okay. But during this uh, this period, and uh, I participate in uh, in all of uh, the events, and without feeling, I uh, I <laughs> I'm getting uh, part of them uh, during this uh, this period. Uh, when they uh, they need the support in Arabic language, they called me. And when I have free time, I I get a friend here in Rome with them, and uh, I we present, uh, I participate even uh, speaking day uh, with them. It was in three for different dates where uh, where. Uh, 
it was a lot of uh, student, international student, and uh, everyone talk about himself uh, or herself and about uh, his culture, uh, his, uh, uh, you know, sharing information about uh, about other uh, other country or other uh, uh, culture. Uh, if uh, and also even during uh, during fasting uh, month in Ramadan, we uh, we uh, we get uh, iftar days, which where uh, everything prepare something and uh, share uh, his uh, his dish in other uh, with other people uh, and uh, many other events. And last thing, <laughs> I get uh, I get uh, thanks to Tandem, uh, I get uh, I get uh, guaranteed to go to China. They helped me to get a scholarship to go to China. Uh, after uh, after two months, I'm going to China, and I'm really even I'm really worried how I will go there. <laughs> How I wish to, to, to find Tandem uh, there in China. How it's yeah. important when you, when you arrive to, uh, to, yeah, to, to new country, you don't know anything about the language, about the information, about, yeah, it's very important for, for, for us. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, yeah. Very Nice to hear, uh, Rola, that actually Tandem, you know, made a difference in uh, your life. Um, because yeah. often we talk about these programs, you know, and here in Brussels we sit and we don't really know, know does it make any impact on the ground. Um, but if I hear you, I see it does. And I think that all the efforts that, you know, uh, the students put in establishing this, this tandem committee is that it really, you know, can make the difference in, in a life um, of a student who comes from a different. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, it's also important. here I mean, and also. I'm also refugees here in, in Italy. You know, just uh, I know, I know uh, first year when I arrived, how it was very, very difficult to enter uh, in city or, or about the university. And, uh, I, how how it's important to find uh, a team like Tandem or another group uh, to to help you in formation or just uh, even sometimes to to have friends. It is definitely um, not easy, and I think I mean this shows us that we have to do more and Tandem was still let's say a pilot in a few universities but hopefully we can expand this even up to China when you go there yeah. <laughs> to find another Tandem committee to to welcome you I hope to arrive uh, Tandem arrive to China <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day yeah <laughs> we'll we'll do yeah. our best so Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Rola, for thank sharing. You. And of course, we wish you all the best uh, in China. And um, with this, I also like to thank all the other speakers on our webinar, because unfortunately, our time is up. Um, we had a lot of interesting experience from Canada to Lebanon to uh, Spain, Italy. Um, it was extremely uh, useful to hear uh, from all of you. And I really want to thank all the students who are in the tandem committees for the work. It really it does uh, make a difference. Uh, so please um, keep it up. And to all the participants, thank you for joining uh, this webinar. We hope uh, you found this interesting, and we also hope you know it could encourage some of you to establish a similar uh, student uh, mentorship schemes in other universities across Europe or even across the world. So with this, we conclude uh, our last tandem webinar. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Goodbye.